happens quite often, actually. So you have to be aware of this, that this is uh, done by non-specialists and, and um, they operate the tumor without asking any specialist. So this happens. But if there is a lesion that fits, it's, it's of course a reason. And in case there are epileptic discharges as well. So then the increased risk for a second seizure uh, lies about at 60%. And we know this from stroke studies where this has been investigated. For other diseases, we don't know, but we assume that it is probably the same and the clinical experience told us, uh, tells us. Um, we should not treat patients in case of a provoked seizure, so after sleep deterioration, alcohol intoxication, of the evening before low blood glucose level are just some examples. Um, in case there is no positive hint for epilepsy, so the MRI is, um, is unremarkable, um, also the EEG, and then treatment can wait. You can discuss with the patient. And in case it's not sure if it was an epileptic seizure, of course you should do further diagnostics like video EG, long-term EG, overnight, and so on. Um, so um, Anthony Marson asked the question, should you treat or should you not treat a patient with a first seizure? And he really tried to estimate the disadvantages and advantages to do this. And it was quite surprising. And I think uh, most epileptologists know this study, but but um, still um, it's, it's somehow, uh, e e even for the experienced one, again, again, uh, surprising if, if you look at the data, because um, it's, it's, it's evident uh, that there is an effect of the seizures, but the effect is not very large. So what did he do? He did an open, randomized, real-life study over several years, um, just, just randomizing, just using um, current, current available drugs at this time. Um, he included patients from the first month of life. Um, febrile, provoked, acute, and symptomatic seizures were excluded because um, they have a different prognosis. And there were more than 700 patients in each arm. And one, one branch of the study was um, immediately treated and the other one was deferred. And this was randomized. Uh, and the choice of anti-seizure medication, so ASM is the abbreviation for anti-seizure medication, which is now more used than anti-epileptic drug, as it was used before. So you will see this uh, through the talk. Um, this was at this time still carbamazepine and valproate, so it's an old study. And surprisingly, um, the difference was not very big. I mean, if you just, um, you can see my mouse, right? So that that's, might be important. You can see my mouse you moving here. Yes, okay. Yes, so, can, yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. So, so the immediate treatment um, was giving you about a 40, a little, little bit more than 40, um, percent of, of um, recurring seizures, and for the deferred treatment, it was only less than 10 percent more. So the difference was not very big. So, so what you gain from treating a person after the first seizure um, is 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 not so much, and it's not dangerous um, to to have a patient not on a drug after the first seizure, even if you have a lesion or so on. So, so um, just to encourage you to, to discuss it with the patient and, and really uh, think about does he need treatment and um, also think of the side effects of, of the co-medication he has, if he has already a lot of medications. And so on. Um, after multiple seizures at randomization, uh, the effect is bigger, yeah, and uh, I think after multiple seizures we should treat, uh, so this is about 15% um, and uh, the number needed to treat is still a lot if you look to uh, other studies in neurology, if, um, if you remember how many patients we have to treat with aspirin after a stroke to get a benefit, um, it's 80, yeah? uh, so it's much larger and uh, it still makes sense to, 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 to teach people, but, but please keep in mind it's not a real problem. Okay, so um, general aspects of uh, anti seizure treatment with anti seizure medications. Seizure freedom, of course, is um, the first thing. Sorry, this is a mistake. It should be without side effects, of course. So the goal is always to have um, seizure freedom without side effects. Um, and you can divide. Uh, the different treatment phases into three areas. And um, in the first area, you, you, you always have this increasing drug dosage over time. And in the first part, you have a 
very good dose response uh, relationship. So, for example, you start with lamotrigine in 100, 100 milligram, um, and you get a reduction, but but not not seizure freedom. And then you switch to 200 and 300 milligram, and then you reach seizure freedom. Seizure freedom. And in this primary phase, you also usually don't have side effects if you are in the low dose range. And this is where we would like to have most of the patients. And I think this is possible for, let's say, 60, 70 percent of patients. Um, then you have a second phase, which is still tolerable. So you further get um, an increase in dosage, um, but um, and, and, and the dose response relation curve gets flattened, yeah, so it's not as steep anymore. Um, but you still reach something for the patient. Uh, you might have some side effects, like a little bit sedation, which, which is tolerable for the patient. So this is still okay, and this depends if you would like to have it or if you would like to change the drug. And then the third phase that you must avoid. Um, so this is really, really important because you don't reach anything for the patient. So you increase the dosage, but there is no effect on seizure reduction, and you just pre produce side effects. Um, and to uh, recognize this phase, it's very important to have a very good seizure diary in which you also note the different dosages. And a very good example is, for example, you start with 1,000 milligram levetiracetam, you get a seizure reduction, of about 50%, but no seizure freedom, you raise to 3,000 milligram levetiracetam, um, and the patient does not benefit, but he gets tired or gets aggressive or whatever. So if you then start the second drug, you should reduce levetiracetam to the 1,000 milligram we had before. Okay, so from this, there are three very simple rules um, that you should always think about. Uh, they are almost trivial, but 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 many people do not um, do not look at those, and and therefore I would like to to repeat them. So, um, first thing is you start with the monotherapy. There are no studies that tell us that a monotherapy is better than a low dose uh, combination therapy. Uh, but, but still, I mean, it's much more accepted, of course, if you start with a monotherapy. You increase the dosage when seizure freedom is not reached. It must not be, as we said in earlier days, that you have to go until the patient does not tolerate it anymore. Um, but uh, um, you, you should have a middle dosage where, where you are uh, sure that um, the patient should profit. Then... Um, the second rule is the most important one. So if you would like to start combination therapies, stop non-effective anti-seizure medications and avoid unnecessary high dosages. So this is exactly this here in the third phase. You are in the third phase and you should reduce to a tolerable dosage and reduce to minimally effective dosages. Um, and the third rule is very trivial, but is important because we have so many anti-seizure medications. As long as seizure freedom is not reached, try other options. Even with thiagabine or felbamate, you can get a person seizure free. This happens uh, rarely, but it happens, and it makes sense to try it. So what kind of... Um, uh, medications do we have? I only pick those that we use... Um, really regularly in daily clinical practice. Um, and I would like to go through these with the main advantages or disadvantages. So carbamazepine, I think, is obsolete. I'm not sure how you how you still use it in, in India. Um, we don't use it anymore as a first uh, choice drug in, in Germany. Of course, if a person is on carbamazepine, it's fine. Um, but you have to consider that it makes enzyme induction and sedation. The sedation is not such a problem. If the patient is not sedated, you can, you can monitor this. But the enzyme induction is a very critical point because many doctors do not know this. So if you, if you have an intern um, that treats um, the patient with epilepsy for a tumor five years later, you introduce carbamazepine, then the chemotherapy might not work. And this has been shown very impressively in trials for um, um, for, for, for children um, with, um, um, how do you say that, blood cancer, yeah? So, um, valproic acid um, has a problem. The teratogenicity has led um, to um, very 
strict restrictions, um, at least in Europe um, and, and by the FDA, not to use it in childbearing Asian women anymore. But there were other uh, problems before even, so I was not using it even before in young women. Um, so you have weight gain, you have tremor, you have hair loss, uh, which is quite common. Um, so it's a good and strong drug, which might be well tolerated, but it's also uh, has its disadvantages. Oxcarbazepin um, is a further development of carbamazepin. It's important to know that this is a different drug. It has a different mechanism of action. I will come to this later. Um, hyponatremia in the elderly is a problem, and so there you have to think about it. It's a, a little bit similar as to the enzyme induction carbamazepine. So the doctor that tr starts a um, diuretic, for example, doesn't think that this causes hypo hyponatremia, and then, he's, and, and, and then the patient will get the hyponatremia that was not there just on oxcarbazepine, for example. So lamotrigine is one of the drugs that we use most and one of the first line, preferred first line drugs. The problem is the slow titration. Um, and of course, there are newer drugs now that don't have this, but it's still the drug that has that we have most experience with. Sometimes it causes sleep problems or headaches, um, but that's the only problem that you have to try it slowly. Um, Gabapentine, you have a three times daily. It's not really used much in epilepsy anymore. Uh, Pyramid is a very strong drug, but it's more in the background because of the cognitive side effects. Um, it has weight loss as one um, sometimes desired side effect. Yeah, so if people have large overweight, um, then you can think about trying to pyramid quite early on. Leviteracetam. Some people say that was the drug of 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 the last thousand years, which changed our regime. Um, before we have carbamazepine and valproic acid, no. Levit now leviteracetam is the drug of choice in in most hospitals in the Western world, and. Um, uh, but it has also problems, so it causes irritability and tiredness, um, and you have to ask for this. Now, all the patients report this, yeah? so you also have to ask the partner about it, yeah? um, because sometimes the patients do not notice it, and the partner does complain about the irritability. Pregabalin is a nice drug for elderly people. It, um, Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't did translate this. Um, so, so this is, um, it, 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 makes, it makes you sleepy. It also um, uh, is, is a good drug against uh, pain with polyneuropathy and tingling. Um, so, so it's a very good co-medication for elderly people that have other diseases. It does cause weight gain. We don't have a license for monotherapy because the trial in direct comparison with lamotrigine failed. Um, and it, it was less effective than Lamotic. So Nizamide is a good alternative. Uh, we use it more and more. It was late coming. I'm not sure how it is in India. I mean, you know that this drug was coming from Japan and was then licensed in the US and very late in, in Europe. And that's a problem with the drug um, that we are not so much familiar with it. But in principle, it's a good alternative to, any, to some of the uh, first line drugs if, if you um, don't uh, reach seizure free. Lacosamide is um, is a very good drug, I think. So, so one of the ones that are coming directly after lamotrigine and levetiracetam, and are probably in terms of of um, side effects um, and efficacy um, equivalents, um, are probably um, on on one level with uh, lamotrigine and levetiracetam, and there is one other uh, that I will come to. Um, and azlicarbazepine. Um, is a little bit like uh, oxcarbazepine. It has a longer half-life, is sometimes so better, but has the same problem with hyponatremia. Perampanel is an amparoceptor antagonist, so this is an interesting drug in terms of his, of, of his mechanism of action, and if you have refractory patients, then it makes sense to use it. And then finally, rivaracetam, I think, is will become the better levetiracetam, but this will, of course, need some time. Yeah? So, um, there are less side effects, less irritability and tiredness if you switch from levetiracetam to rivaracetam. I will come to this, um, and it could become because of, because also of its broad um, effectiveness. Yeah? So, so also in in generalized epilepsies, we know this not very well from studies so far, but we know it from from our experience. 
um, that it, I think will become one of the drugs um, in, in the future that we start very early on. And then there are some uh, medications of, of later choice, like phenytoin, um, phenobarbitone, uh, vigabatrine, and so on, uh, which you should keep in mind if you have difficult to treat patients, but which are not the first ones to use. Um, so what was the important study to teach us that lamotrigine is better than carbamazepine? Because before everybody was getting carbamazepine, and after this study, this changed dramatically. Um, so that was the study, Sanat A, also um, done by, by Tony Marsen. And this is, these are the retention rates over six years. It's again a real-life study, uh, open but, but randomized. Um, and you see that lamotrigine is much better retained than carbamazepine. And the reason is that it's just better tolerated because the efficacy is the same. Yeah? So if you compare here the efficacy, this is the probability of getting 12-month uh, remission from seizures. And there you see that this is uh, well done. And until this study, everybody thought that lamotrigine is well tolerated, but not as efficacious as carbamazepine. So it was a very, very important study which changed life, at least in Germany and in many other places. Um, you have to think in the elderly as well to use the right medications. Um, also here, this was published in 2015. I think this is the best study that has been done in the elderly comparison of carbamazepine controlled release form at milligram. That's also important if you try carbamazepine you should try it at a very low dosage. Yeah? Um, then it might be a very good drug. But still, uh, it was less um, uh, retained. Again, this is a retention rate here. It was less retained than lamotrigine and levetiracetam. Um, and this is just the seizure freedom rate. Um, it was also better on levetiracetam. And, uh, and uh, sorry, seizure freedom, uh, seizure freedom rate was similar in both, uh, sorry, but the time until the first side effects came um, was, of course, different uh, for the for the three drugs. And carbamazepine was clearly the loser of that study. Okay, so. How should we treat focal seizures? Um, in Germany, we have, um, ah, okay, there is again a little bit of a mistake by my translation of the slides. Um, so um, for all those um, where you have a star, generics are available, at least in Germany, um, uh, which means that the price is much lower. Um, and um, the, the preferred drugs of monotherapy are lamotrigine and levetiracetam. Um, and the alternatives in monotherapy are the other drugs that I mentioned to you. Um, and then we have those drugs only licensed for combination therapy. Of course, you can use them in monotherapy if other drugs fail. And we have a lot of patients, for example, on monotherapy with piracetam already, uh, where other drugs failed or caused side effects. And um, I will come also to the combination therapy state. Generics, there is some problematic situation um, um, with, with changes from one drug to the other, but I think it's less important than we thought for a long time, and I won't go into this. I would like to present a case um, to you. This is a 17-year-old female. Since four years, she has episodes with jerking of shoulders and arms bilaterally after awakening, particularly when getting up early, and I think you all know the kind of the diagnosis. Um, and uh, the question is, what kind of therapy would you would you give um, to this girl? And at this time, I still started myself. Valproate, well, this was, I think, about 20 years ago. And um, she came back with 1,000 milligram Valproate. She was seizure-free. Um, she had tremendous side effects of trauma, 8 kilogram weight gain, and so everything that a 70-year-old can do really likes to have. And uh, therefore, um, we, of course, had to change the medication. But what kinds of change would we use here? So what do you think would be the best drug? There are drugs that can antagonize um, one of the side effects, and this is topiramate. And I have made very good experience to use topiramate in these patients, because if you use a, a drug that is neutral to, to weight, then 
They usually I eat the weight. They have difficulties to lose the weight. If you take the power mate, they will lose the weight within six to eight weeks, almost sure. Yeah, so, um, and um, she also lost weight, um, and you have to use very small dosages, this is important. Yeah. Um, the problem was, uh, we had to increase it because she had then some further seizures, she had massive speech problems. Um, we reduced it again because the seizures were always provoked, yeah, uh, but on neuropsychology, um, it was still revealed that she had slight cognitive deficits, she was um, finishing school, and of course we didn't want her to have this. We switched to Lamotrigine, um, and uh, she had a recurrence of the myoclonic seizures, and, and at a quite high frequency, even higher than before. This is also a typical problem with lamotrigine in generalized epilepsies, and particularly in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy of the patient here. And then we changed the levetiracetam, and since then she is long-term seizure-free, no side effects. Okay, and I have a video of such a seizure, because it is not so often seen, I thought it's quite useful. You see the very brief jerking, yeah, so I'm not sure if you can see it, because sometimes the video doesn't work with the programs, but here again, he's briefly jerking on both sides of the body. Uh, she notices the seizure doesn't lose consciousness. It's, it's, the, it's the only generalized seizure with, um, with um, reserved consciousness, reserved consciousness. So this is a generalized seizure, and uh, you see the EG, the generalized body side wave, which is typical for these kind of epilepsies. So for the treatment of generalized seizures, um, it is really much more difficult. Levetiracetam is not really licensed for generalized seizures. It's only licensed in combination therapy. Um, but people give it and start with it now. Most people start with levetiracetam. Um, because it's more tolerated, it's probably safe in, in childbearing agents or other companies. But associamide is a very good drug for Parkinson's epilepsies and um, better tolerated than valproic acid. And lamotrigine it has the problem that it's less effective. I like to start with lamotrigine nevertheless, uh, because if it works, you have a long-term, very good perspective, particularly for young women with a, with a, a very good um, a, a profile during pregnancy and, and so on. So you have to choose between those. Um, you can use valproic acid in, in men, but, but not in, uh, in male, but, but, but not in female. Um, then treatments of second choice after pyramate. Sunizamide is not licensed in Germany. I'm not sure how it is in India. Parampanel, lacrosamide, and ribrasetam are now coming. Um, in Germany, it's not licensed yet for generalized epilepsies, but, but this will come as well. And um, what we need is a proper study uh, to show, because that would be really a very good uh, um, drug as alternative. I have some patients on rivacetam who did not tolerate David um, and particularly I remember one patient which uh, could be um, nice to, to, to think about for you as well. You can go down with the dosage very, very much. So this patient was very, very sensitive to any anti-seizure medication we tried. And uh, um, so we, we tried then um, after uh, lamotrigine, uh, levetiracetam, and I think also um, lacrosamide and valproic acid, we tried rivaracetam, which was coming to the market at this time. We tolerated it better, but still had side effects. And I went down to two times 12.5 milligrams. And she is still seizure-free. She has a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. That's a very nice example that it works very well in the patient. Okay, and the other treatments are quite clear. I don't think I have to go into detail with this. So, pregnancy, wish to have children, um, general aspects. Um, so, please plan the pregnancy. Estimate the risk of malformations realistically. This is very, very important. So, there are still a lot of doctors that tell the patient, oh, you are a young woman, you have epilepsy, you cannot have children because if you take antileptic drugs, um, you will get a, a, a child with a malformation. And, and most patients just believe it in a way that they think, oh, it's really, I, I will get a child that is malformed um, or that has a malformation uh, to 90 to 100%. Yeah? So, so they do not really see 
that this risk is not so big. I mean, even with micro aid, below 1,000 milligram or one below 700 milligram per day, depending on the study and, and the register um, that has been used, um, it's just increasing or, um, the usual rate of malformations uh, by two, yeah, by a factor of two. So it's not really a dramatic. They still have a chance to get a normal child in more than 90% of the cases. And this is really, really important. Avoid combination therapies. Um, there is a potential exception with levetiracetam and, and lamotrigine, which does not show an increased risk as well. Um, normal birth and breastfeeding are possible and are desired, so you should advise your patients they should get this. And uh, preferred medications during pregnancy are lamotrigine. There's no risk below 300 milligram. Above, there is an increased risk, but um, it's, it's, it's moderate. Levy trust there are increasingly very good data, and there might be some data on oxalazepine. But it's promising, and carbamazepine is also, there are some good data for small dosages, um, up to 400 milligram. Um, and uh, this is just the most recent study from the European Pregnancy Registry, which is now worldwide. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from you later in the discussion if you uh, participate to Europe uh, in, um, in India as well. So lamotrigine and levetiracetam are the ones um, that do not have it goes independently overall a um, increased risk. But if you look in the dose dependency, then of course you see that lamotrigine, that there is a difference between below seven, uh, 300 and, and, uh, and, and bigger than uh, Okay, and there's always this dose dependency. We think that there are some data around it. This is not the case for Levit Russell Town, but the data were not sufficient here because the number of cases was just still on this. And for Oxcarbazepine, it's only 300 patients, yeah, but there's also a very, there are also very promising data. Okay, so let's come to the more difficult cases. Um, uh, Cornel Brody found in um, 2000, and this has been um, uh, this has been um, confirmed since in many different studies, um, that after two different mono or polytherapies, um, you will lose efficacy dramatically. So after the first monotherapy, about 50% of the patients become seizure-free. After the second, only 30% of the initial population, and so not of the remaining of the initial. And after the third monotherapy, it's really not very much sure it depends. And, and, and in total, you get about two-thirds seizure-free. And this study has led to the... Um, sorry, this, this should be a little bit up here... Um, um, this led to the uh, conclusion by the LAE in 2010 that people should be called pharmacoresistant if two medications have failed that have given inadequate dose. Okay, and uh, just to show you the most recent study uh, to confirm this, these were 1,800 patients, not just 200, uh, um, and you get about the same results um, about 50% for the first drug, um, up to between 10 and 15 for the other drugs and then here. But you should also consider that if you look at the patient percentage of patients that achieve seizure freedom with AD regimen from the remaining population, then of course it's worth to try this. Yeah? So for example, with the fourth, fifth, and even with the sixth drug, um, you still have a chance to get a patient seizure free uh, in about 14% of the cases. And this has also been shown earlier. I try here from, um, um, from Jackie French and her group. Um, this was showing that over four years um, with, with a free regimen, uh, about 15 to 20% of the patients get seizure free. Yeah. And this was after Levitin-Rosetan came to the market. So, Always think about try whatever you have still available for the patient, and yes, think about how you can uh, how yes, you can still treat him and get him seizure free. Okay, sir. Um, some yes, thoughts sir. to the rational polytherapy. Um, so there is okay, the theoretically reasonable combinations are those that maximize efficacy through additive or synergistic effects. 
And that they minimize side effects by using non-interacting drugs without common side effects or without joint side effects. And the question is, of course, um, should we combine anti-seizure medications with different mechanisms of action? This has never been really shown. Um, and because it's very difficult to, to put this but into study, uh, but there is a lot of evidence that we have from daily clinical practice that this is really the case. Yes, so, and therefore, we should know the mechanisms of that. Um, this is the big group of sodium channel blockers, and there we know that um, uh, the combination is problematic. Uh, it was particularly shown in the study uh, uh, of lacosamide when lacosamide was started, you may remember that um, it was not licensed be beyond 400 milligram per day because lacosamide was often combined with other anti epileptic, uh, with other sodium channel blockers, particularly carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Uh, and then people went to, to become dizzy and, and, um, and, had, and, and people didn't think about uh, that they have to reduce um, the concomitant medication, in that case, carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. Um, and you should consider also that carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, and esdecarbazepine are different medications. One is blocking fast inactivation, the other slow inactivation of the sodium channel, but still they have, they have additive side effects. Uh, like the typical side effects of sodium channel blockers, dopia, uh, dizziness, unsteady gait, and so on. Then there are a group of calcium channel blockers which are presynaptic or um, uh, work on burst firing, in particular in thalamic cells, and this is why etosuximide, valproic acid, and zanizamide probably work very well um, in general seizures. Uh, GABAergic mechanisms are available and, and other modes of actions we have here, uh, like uh, Riracetam and also Perampanel should be, should be added here as an amperoceptor uh, blocking drug. So now to the uh, specific aspects of Riracetam. So the third thing is, of course, um, if you would like um, if you think that Rivracetam is the same main mechanism of action, should you try at all Rivracetam in a patient that is resistant to Levetiracetam? And the answer is clearly yes, you should. Uh, because Rivracetam is a very well-tolerated drug and you still can have benefits from this. So the benefits were larger on Levitracetam naive patients. Yeah, so you got um, responder rates more than 50% compared to placebo, which was in the range of 25%. Um, but also, if they had prior Levitracetam, there was a clear difference and significant difference between placebo and uh, and the drug. And there was also, no, there was not really a dose, dose difference, uh, but it was clear that about one third of the patients here. Uh, still profit and are responders um, with a more than 50% seizure reduction. So first question answered, if you had levetiracetam before, you should still try rivacetam just for the for the sake of effectiveness and, and not only for tolerability. Then the question, uh, second important question is, um, how fast can you switch from levetiracetam? Because I think this is probably still the most important um, field to use Rivaracetam, at least, at least with us in Germany. So if Levitracetam is not tolerated well, we would like to switch to Rivaracetam. It's fast and easy and, uh, and, and very quickly to realize. Um, and um, the question is then, can you switch fast within 24 hours? So overnight, yeah, switch completely from Levitracetam to Rivaracetam. Um, or should you do this um, in a delayed version, just like decreasing levetiracetam and in a parallel increasing rivacetam. And you see that this is not necessary. In terms of efficacy uh, for the 50% responders and for those that were getting seizure, were, were becoming seizure free, um, you had the same rates uh, 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 irrespective of, of um, the fast twitches and, and the slow twitches. So there was no problem. And then maybe the most important question of Brivacetam, uh, does it have less behavioral side effects? And uh, this has been now shown in many studies. 
Um, the only little problem that we might have is that these were all not head-to-head -head studies. And it was always uh, also never tried if you switch from real assets to beverage test and if you, if you see the same effect. But what is clear from many studies is just one of, I think, um, uh, half a dozen studies that have been published now. Um, they are all real-life studies, retrospective, um, and um, you, you look at um, the uh, most common adverse events and, and uh, particularly the, the behavioral side effects here. Um, so there were 38% before rivacetam was, was started um, on the other medications, and this switched in time of three months to 20%. It was always half of it. It was already half of it, and um, then to 4% after three months. You have to consider that the numbers are quite small, but if you take all the studies together, yeah, I think it's, it's quite a lot of patients. In this study, we had about 500 patients across Germany, and there are a few other studies um, that, that reach with size, and, and, and they all show about more or less the same effects and the same as um, which for aggression and irritability. But also the other side effects here, fatigue, seizure, um, uh, dizziness, and, and depression also, also decreased uh, during this time. So it's efficacious and it's also really well tolerated. Um, and about other indications, I've just picked now status epilepticus because for us it's really a help to have Brevacetam in the clinic also as an IV um, applicable drug. Um, and there are two retrospective studies um, in, in very, really very small uh, numbers of patients. Um, here they had seven of 14 responders, um, and the loading dose was a little bit different, so you could, you should use a high loading dose um, of 200 milligram at least, maybe also even 400 milligram. Um, and um, um, here in this study, they had three of 11 responders of refractory uh, status epileptics because rivacetam was never tried first, of course, um, it was after, usually after levit rivacetam or coid um, and, and benzodiazepines, of course. So there is efficacy, and we also have positive um, experiences with the rivacetam. Um, and then um, there was a question I was asked before. I did not really get it because uh, Schedule 5 of, of the FDA-controlled substances is um, uh, something that you should consider uh, if, if there is any physical dependence um, or abuse of, of Brevacetam. I've never thought of this because I never had such experiences, and, and they also came to the conclusion from, from the studies that this is not um, so, so, sorry, this is sick. no potential for abuse and, and no evidence for physical. So, should be no problem. Okay, now I would like to come to a couple of new possibilities because there's so much going on. Um, just quickly to Sinovamate, I'm not sure if this is already coming in India. It's, it's a new drug that has... Um, um, Another mode of action which is really interesting it has a, is a combined sodium channel blocker and GABA agonist. Um, and this was a typical randomized double blind multi centric phase two study with those finding and efficacy. And the efficacy was quite remarkable. Um, so, with um, 400, so this is just responder rates, and most remarkable was, was this year. Um, you got very high seizure freedom rates, 11% with 200 milligram and 21% with 400 milligrams. So this has never been reached by, by a different drug. We have now to see if this is really uh, becoming true in real practice, but, but usually not. Um, but but um, uh, this we just have to see. It may cause stress. You have to go slowly. Otherwise, the side effects are quite similar to other sodium channel blocking drugs. Um, and there's also real world data already uh, quite available. So you should slowly increase the doses by 50 milligrams every two weeks. So let's come to the ratio of polytherapy um, and combinations. I have marked here drugs in blue and in black. And those that are black here and black here can be combined very well. Um, so if we would like to combine sodium channel lockers, we get a problem. If you combine lamotrigine with oxcarbazepine, lacosamide, acicarbazepine, also with sonizamide, 
Um, and sometimes it's parampanel because it um, also causes dizziness, and then you have a problem, but it's very well and easy to combine lamotrigine with levetiracetam, with priracetam, and, and with some other drugs. I won't get to this because I think we are running out of time a little bit, yeah? So um, I think this is not so important. Um, Fenfluramine is a very, very interesting option in Dravet syndrome. So there are now increasingly interesting um, uh, drugs coming for rare diseases. We'll just like, briefly go through this. So it's an azotherapy available as an antisense oligonucleotide and that enhances the expression of, um, of NAV 1.1, the channel that is decreased in this disease. And this has just been shown in mice, but, but clinical trials are, uh, will, be, will be started very soon. This is a study here that we did uh, retrospectively in people with SCN2A associated epilepsies. So we could clearly show that in dependence of the age of onset, there, uh, there was a very good response in early days and in late and at later stages, uh, not a good response. And the reason is um, that in early stage and with, with early onset of the disease, so below three months of age, you have gain of function mutations, and with later onset, you have loss of function. This was a very nice correlation that helps you. So if you have such patients in neuropediatric practice, um, you should think about this. And there's also an azotherapy coming for SCN2A, which is very effective in the animal model. You can see that here this is just the survival uh, rates of these mice. Um, <clears throat> And this is something uh, we did in our lab here, which is a new medication for, I mean, well, it's not a new medication, it's, it's a potassium channel blocker. So we surprisingly found that uh, this channel, enhanced activity of this channel, um, can cause this severe epilepsy. And she is very attactic. If you, if you, if you look how, how she is walking, she is going from one side to the other, she is almost falling. Um, she also had a bad language and so on and so on. And um, this is just our uh, discovery here that this channel is increasing the activity compared to the wild type. And if we uh, give a drug here for aminopuridine, which is known as vampiridine or vampira um, and licensed for hydrocirrhosis, um, um, you can give this drug here. And so she is running again. And I would like to show you a how she is walking now, and how she walks in a straight line. Uh, so the ataxia is much better. She became seizure free. She became seizure free, um, and she had a much better language. She was, she was speaking three words later, five word sentences, and no problems anymore. And we have found such effects in, uh, in a couple of patients now. Okay, so to come to my conclusions, um, a flowchart for epilepsy therapy. You use monotherapy, and the goal is always to have seizure freedom without any side effects. There are two uh, scenarios where you should switch from a first to a second monotherapy, and this is if you have seizure freedom with side effects. So typical is you have seizure freedom with levetiracetam, you might like to switch to piracetam even if it's not licensed to monotherapy. Um, and that's one possibility. Um, if there is no effect um, on monotherapy, then you just stop the drug and go to a second monotherapy. It's more difficult if you have a partial effect of the drug, then you might go on to a combination therapy, which can be well tolerated. And if there is no effect, then um, the patients are pharmacoresistant, according to the IDE definition. You should think about how uh, to evaluate for epilepsy surgery, and only if this is not possible, then you should go to further combination therapies, um, virus nerve stimulation, deep brain stimulation, and so on. Um, there is a very nice algorithm uh, to stop the seizure medications. I won't go into the details. I just would like to mention this. Uh, there's a couple of factors that you should look at, like epilepsy duration before remission, um, febrile seizures in, in preliminary and the EG and so on. And then you can calculate uh, the recurrence risk here on the scale. Um, there is also um, some kind of online programs where you can use this. Um, you can find it on the ILE homepage. It's very easy. Um, and it's, it's quite useful. Um, you can see here like 50%, 55 and 30% recurrence risk. It's, it's helpful. 
uh, to the sales of the patients. So I conclude, please use well-tolerated and procedure medications. Never give up your patient. Always think you can what you can still do and um, think of epilepsy surgery very early on. Consider the rules of combination therapy. So think about the ratio of therapy. Think about the mechanisms of actions to avoid side effect uh, profiles. Um, reduce concomitant medication when side effects occur. Um, and be open for new therapeutic opportunities and think sometimes of stopping the medication. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your practice calls in general and in particular Practice with perfection and precision. And you have shown us the appreciation in terms of industry and innovation. And innovation is finally giving us a really world of good voyage and how to practice medicine in perfection. I think you taught us very, very clearly your extreme good research applied practically to each and every patient. I think you have served the purpose of what I call it as the coping methods excellently shown. The communication modules were excellent. I think the compliance modules you showed how it will be useful so that the control of the cure of epilepsy is definitely in our hands safely with your good lecture. Now I request Professor now I request Professor Satish Adilkar sir, you can just give your comments or ask any questions to him. At the end, there are some questions straight away addressed to you. Please answer those questions also to Professor, Professor Satish Adilkar, please. I think firstly it was a fantastic lecture and uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Holger for uh, uh, telling us about it. And I think you so clearly covered so many aspects of this very complex disease. I was just thinking about one thing in our, our patients and I'll, um, we'll discuss that. You know, whenever a drug doesn't do too well and the patient is not too comfortable, either with the side effect profile or with the effects or lack of efficacy, and you want to propose a second drug that is in the same group, I always find patients reacting very differently to, uh, to this approach. Some would say, oh, why do you want to give me uh, a drug from the same group? And uh, would it also not fail? And some others would say, um, look, I'm comfortable with this in terms of side effects. If this is a superior drug in the same category, I would like to have it. So I think moving from Levitiracetam to the newer molecule, we are probably going to have both types of reactions from uh, patients when we discuss, um, discuss this switch. And I would like to know everybody's views on that. Hey. Yeah, um, so um, I think it's, of course, easy if um, if levetiracetam is not tolerated and the patient has profited from the drug. I mean, that's easy. You will, you will do it. Yeah? So you can easily show that to the patient. Um, and um, otherwise, it's, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's also not so difficult. I think Riracetam has so many advantages because it's very quick. I mean, if you have somebody on Levitiracetam, you would like to know, um, and if, if seizures are frequent, you know this within a month. And you just switch to, to I, I forgot to, to mention the dosages that we use. I'm not sure how you do it. We always switch to two, point, uh, to two times 50 milligram Riracetam. Rivaracetam, regardless from what dosage we come. Yeah? So um, it's it's equal if they have 3,000 or 1,000 milligram levitiracetam. We just switch to two times 50 milligram. It's usually really well tolerated, and it's it's an immediate switch. So every other trial that you that you would start would take longer. Yeah, and and you would always have this this kind of difficulty with increasing the dosage and so on. So. So we really often use it. We don't use it, of course, in, in second choice, uh, rarely in third choice, but for fourth choice, it's, it, it's coming up. Yeah? It's, and, and, and in particular, when levetiracetam fails and seizures are frequent, then we tell, let's see, sometimes we know in one to two, uh, four weeks what's going on, and then we switch to the next. A, a general comment about drug dosages in India, that 
the general belief of Indian neurologists is that uh, Indian people uh, tolerate dosages a small, uh, don't tolerate big dosages, and side effects come up a little more early. And this may have things to do with the body weight, the slow acetylation in the liver, and various factors. So generally, we would start with a smaller dose and okay. uh, and go go sort of more more slowly. Yeah. Back to you, Dr. Srinivas. This is a very good point. I also concur with that. Go slow and then go low. And then go to high. And uh, is that the practice in Germany? I was told that they also do low doses from some other people. Is it true? I mean, uh, of course, we start low and go high um, uh, in general, but with Priracetam, it's really a difference. Yeah? So I would never do this with Leviracetam because there is a clear increase in the side effects. I would also never start with Priracetam with 2 times 100 milligram unless it's a very, very severe, difficult to treat epilepsy and so on. I would just like to see the, see the effect. But I think the evidence that 200 milligram really work better than, than 100 milligrams per day is, is very low. Um, and, and I have seen this rarely. Um, okay, first of all, a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Holga. My question is that the data have shown that if the person has cognitive behavioral problem or depression, um, you switch from levetiracetam to brevetiracetam and you get a better result. Now, uh, in LEV-9 patients, the patient shows this sort of uh, behavioral problem with Leviracetam. Have you tried switching to Leviracetam and see whether that has altered the situation? I just want to uh, ask you whether these are one individual is more sensitive to side effects with one molecule and less to the other. Yeah, right. I mean, I mentioned this briefly in my talk. Of course, this has not been done, and obviously, it, it would be fair to do either a head-to-head -head study or or just do do once in. But of course, we haven't tried this because we always use levetiracetam first. Yeah. So and and um, also also in our clinic, I've. I've Really, I, I think maybe one to two patients that I tried on Vibracetam directly because they were very, very sensitive to side effects. Um, and, and and if it didn't work, I did not go to Levitracetam, then I switched to another drug. Uh, Dr. 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 Yes, uh, please. Uh, yes, Dr. Yes. Sorry, uh, do you think Dr. Holger, uh, that is what trying then, switching from Vibracetam to Levitracetam? I, I didn't understand this. Could you repeat, please? Now, do you think um, it's worth trying from Bericetam to Levitiristam in live life patients? Uh, it's, it's, it's always worth to try another drug. I mean, it's not the same drug. So if you are really, um, if you don't have other choices, I, I wouldn't do it if you have other choices, I think. Yeah. Uh, Russia, your comments and then your thoughts, please. Uh, Dr. Holger, fantastic lecture. Thank you so much. It was, uh, you know, Thank so you. and clear. Thank you. It was a pleasure to hear that. Uh, you know, I have a question about, so sometimes in our country, we tend to use levetiracetam in the last few years. Like you said, it was this drug over a thousand years. And we've really utilized it a lot in the last decade, possibly. And we've gained a lot of confidence while using it, now, especially in situations where we have a situation of a person having seizures with an infection, for example, a tuberculoma, tuberculous meningitis, sometimes viral infections. So where do you see, so we have a problem with rivocetam and its interaction with the right famsin. So, uh, you know, so we have a problem. Uh, I, I think that that, you know, because for us, that's, levetiracetam has been the go-to drug in a person with, um, a tuberculosis which is going on where you think an anti-epileptic is required. But I think this would be a challenge for this drug in this group of patients, which is not very small in our country. It's substantial. Yeah. And um, the other concern I have is what is your experience in situations where you're using, let's say, anti-infectious agents? So, like, for example, a viral encephalitis where you're using, you know, asaxovir. We routinely use lentricetam in these situations. So, is there, can you give us a little bit of insight in that? 
Well, actually, I haven't thought about it so much because um, usually these patients respond well to therapy. Um, you don't have to consider really complicated changes from levetiracetam to piracetam or so on. But of course, it has a kind of a little bit enzyme induction that you have to um, that you have to keep in mind. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm not sure if it induces uh, acyclovir. I'm, I'm, I don't know. Um, um, but rifampicina, that's right. Yeah. So, so it's um, it's a problem, and then I wouldn't use it. I mean, we have so many other choices um, that that it's not really necessary. Yeah. Or I mean, of course, you could in a patient that has a problem. Then I would just go to to look at the serum level and then increase the dosage accordingly. Um, if if it's a uh, I mean, it, it might be a problem because you have to treat so long. Yeah. So if you have to treat well, a half year or, or even a year or so, and you don't find another drug that is well tolerated, then I probably would just control the serum levels of, of rifampicin, and, and then you can just go up with rifampicin in the dosage. That would be a possibility. Thank you. And also, do you have any uh, anything like a pregnancy registry which is ongoing with this reverse time which you can nothing that oh. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure why drug companies are so reluctant to do these registries really, really nicely. I mean, the reason why we have so much uh, experience with lamotrigine was that GlaxoSmithKline really did this from the very beginning on. Yeah, so they had a, a, a very, very good uh, registry. And they were after it, so they were really chasing the patients. Yeah? So, so otherwise, you don't get the numbers. And of course, we have Europe, which is working, but it depends if, if people, um, and, and then you need monotherapy. So I, I think it will take ages until we know this. Unless a company like Linux would chase the patients. I mean, this would be, would be really uh, a, an appeal to, to do this. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Holger Lersch, uh, for a fantastic lecture. Uh, what I liked about uh, your talk was that you actually took us across uh, the many decades uh, of work in epilepsy, starting from uh, you know monotherapy, which was stressed in those days. Uh, uh, quite a lot, and then went on to the rational polytherapy, and then went on to talking about channelopathies and how different channels, and that's very pertinent to the pediatric age group, where uh, now we are able to sort of dissect uh, the epilepsies into various uh, syndromes, and within the syndrome, then so there are him, you know, him, further uh, subsets, which, are, which behave completely yes, differently because of uh, different channels and other uh, mutations which are there, and how we approach them. So, uh, that's what I liked about your talk, you. because uh, all encompassing uh, kind of talk gives us a lot of uh, 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 introspection about how we are going to treat our patients. Yeah. And then you told us how to combine yes, these medications and which not to combine. Which are also quite good. Now, I would like to ask you uh, what is your uh, take yes, on uh, Revrastam? What are yes, the situations sir. in which you would yes, sir, yes, sir. choose Revrastam in a particular patient in your practice? I mean, from yes, what we know. Uh, somebody who was on Levitrastam, who did not tolerate Levitrastam, got behavioral adverse events. Yes, of course, we can try Brevastam and yes. uh, we can switch immediately. That's the advantage. And uh, the incidence yes, of behavioral sir. adverse events really reduces quite drastically, which has yes, been shown sir. in uh, know, several yes. studies. Uh, which are the other situations yes, where you would choose this uh, as a frontline drug or, or as a, a further up, you know, yes. you were saying you're choosing it as a third add-on or a fourth add-on. Do you yes. think it will go up with the armamentarium coming in as yes. first add-on for Hello some Hello patients, Hello. second add-on for the others? I think it has the potential yes, to come up. Yes. Um, of course, there are several things that have to be um, thought about, I mean, it's a little bit early to tell about long-term side effects. Yeah, so so we have it now for I don't know four years or so. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so you would like to have at least five um, when you remember vagabatrine um, and and the concentral visual field defects that come after ten, after ten years of usage. Um, so, so that's one point we have why to consider. That? Yeah, so that's also one reason why you wouldn't give it at first choice and before levetiracetam. Oh, 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 okay, 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 okay. Then, of course, the economic perspective is always there. It's more expensive, simply. Yeah. Um, and um, so, so that's also yes. something where the insurances look look for. Yes. 
Yes. Um, uh, and yes, that's easy to get the book. Yeah. So, so people have to know. But I think it's definitely one of the four best tolerated drugs, which are lamotrigine, levetiracetam, lacosamide, and embriracetam. In my in my view, yeah. And there are some others, but the, the, if you look at azithromycin, it's probably very similar, but it's, it has this problem of hyponatremia in the elderly. Yes, and, yes, um, so, yes. So, and, and, yes, yes. and from that perspective. Um, There are patients that are really difficult to treat and that really get side effects in very low dosages, yeah, so that even with 50 milligram lamotrigine get side effects um, in any kind. Of, and, and then I try to use pre-racetam before So these are the very few patients okay, I mean, that, are and helpful, um, that are treated primarily with, with pre-racetam. Yes. No, and otherwise, it's it. like you said. So it's, it's okay. usually after the pre-racetam and, and yes. depending on the situation that I mentioned. Thank yes. you. Yes. Professor Nanda Niyadi, you have answered doctors some questions if you have. Yes, sir. Uh, can you just comment on the questions that have been asked on your yes, address to you? Yes, sir. Yeah, like yes, rapid tranquilization. Yes, yes, what is your experience related to How rapid tranquilization we can do it later. Once that turns down, then Sorry, I cannot answer this question because I'm an adult neurologist and <laughs> okay. I, I, I really don't have the experience. <laughs> But I could imagine, actually, I mean, one thing that I remember very, very well. I mean, when Levituracetam was hyped in 2000, yeah, and uh, there was a big congress in Paris um, when when this first uh, study of, of Kepra was, was done, uh, the, after the licensing, um, and all the adult neurologists said, oh, this is a new wonder drug, and it's fantastic, and so on. And, and the pediatrician said, no, we don't believe that. Because, yeah, and, and the reason the reason is that the irritability is much higher in children than in adults. And if Brivaracetam does not have this high level of irritability in children, it could become the Levituracetam for children. I mean, that, that would be a great potential. Yeah. Professor Rashi, can I be a question addressed to you? Yes, sir. Your views on the question that is given to you. Right. right about no, no I think, I think uh, Dr. Olga, you pretty much covered, like I said, the entire talk. And I think one of the, uh, the, the, you've covered all the aspects. And I think our main concerns have been in, when we're using a new drug, we don't want to use it in women of the childbearing age group because of the potential of them getting pregnant. You've already addressed the thing about children. And I said in our country, one of the one of the worries that we have is that we are using it with the multiple other drugs, especially like I said, anti-infective agents. So you've pretty much covered all that, and I I want to thank you. And uh, I just want to ask you about this new agent, this Cenobamate that you know uh, has recently, uh, you know, it's been FDA approved in 2019. So uh, do you think that is going to be as much of a game changer as? Uh, any of these agents, because really, I mean, the data seems to be absolutely fantabulous. Like you said, seizure freedom rates seem to be very high. So that's something I wanted to ask you also about. I mean, I mean there are two, two aspects. One is this high rate of seizure freedom. The other is um, that uh, it's a benzo uh, or GABA ergic drug that is uh, hopefully not causing tolerance and, and hopefully not causing, um, has, doesn't have this um, potential for abuse and, and um, um, how, do you, how do you say it, um, a dependency on the drug. Yeah? So, um, if, so, so if you need the drug and if you get um, uh, symptoms of the deprivation when, when, when you don't have it. Um, so I think that's very, very one very, very interesting aspect. Um, And, and the other one is, of course, the high seizure freedom rate. We have tried it in about 10 patients now. So we have the ma medication not freely on the market. We have a compassionate use program at the moment. Um, so we must order it. And it's, of course, a little bit of, of, of effort to do this. So we don't do it in every patient. But, but we have um, tried it. And um, the first thing I can tell is that it's better tolerated than I thought from the studies. So even at high dosages. So, so I think this is this is encouraging. Um, and but if, if the high seizure freedom rate uh, rate will will hold, I don't know. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Professor Nandaji, uh, your thoughts 
Then your question that have been addressed to you, I can just give your views. Uh, there's one question asked to me by Dr. Maurami Dash. But he said that left to breast switch or behavioral adverse effect is known in focal onset seizures, but if shifting to breath is considered for behavioral side effects in generalized seizures. I thought there are some data saying that brevetsetum is very effective in generalized seizures too. So I guess you can do the switch from left to breath in generalized seizures as well. I would like to have uh, Dr. Holder's uh, views on that. Yeah, I think I think you principally can do this. Uh, I mean, in, in, I'm not sure how it is in India with non-licensed drugs in, in, in off-label use. Yeah, so in Germany, um, there are two two things to for, to consider. One is that the insurance might get you on uh, regression. No, 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 not regression. How do you say that? Um, um, I don't know the English expression. So they will charge you for the drug. Yeah, and and um, so, so so that's one problem. It's not such a big problem because the price for Vivacetam is not that high, at least in Germany. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's a phone. Yeah, I have to. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so um, the price is one problem. The other problem is easy because you. You have to take it with the patient, yeah, and you have to get consent from the patient that he uh, uh, wants to have this off label. Um, so, in principle, in Germany, you would have to ask the insurance. Um, I don't do this when I already had a lot of other drugs, yeah, and since levetiracetam is also not licensed for monotherapy in generalized epilepsies. So I usually start with lamotrigine and, and, and then go to levetiracetam. If this doesn't work, um, you probably don't have to ask the insurance. At least I didn't for the few patients that I had and didn't have a problem. Uh, Professor Satish Kabilkar, sir, your view and the question that I've been addressed to you. Is yeah. sir. Yes, certainly. I think the question that I received was, is there any comparative data between brevaracetam and lacosamide. And I must say, I had to look it up. And I could only find indirect comparative studies uh, of brevaracetam with lacosamide and uh, lamotrigine. And most of them did not uh, did not point out many, many differences. So uh, let's have Dr. Holger's view on that. But I couldn't find anything saying one superior to the other between brevaracetam, lacosamide, and I also looked at lamotrigine. Dr. Holger? Yeah, I, I would not expect that. Um, I mean, um, it's always difficult to, to accept some um, results that are that differ a little bit from your clinical practice. So, for example, if I compare lamotrigine and levetiracetam, I would say that levetiracetam is less well tolerated. Yeah, uh, because you have this irritability and tiredness and so on. But there, there are a few studies, head-to-head uh, -head comparison, which didn't show any difference between lamotrigine and levetiracetam. Yeah, so, um, and, and going from there, um, I would say that probably you won't find a difference between lamotrigine, levetiracetam, lacosamide, and brevaracetam if you try them head-to-head -head in monotherapy. But of course, there are differences. Lacosamide is a sodium channel blocker, so if you want to combine it with sodium channel blockers, then you should not take it and should rather take the racetam. Uh, as, as, as I said and, and, and showed you on this one slide, uh, what, what can be combined easily and, and, and what not. Um, so this is what you have to take in, uh, have in mind, but, on, but if, if you consider monotherapy or combination without any sodium channel blocker, then, then it shouldn't be a problem. Also, one general comment can I make, uh, Dr. Srinivasan? Yeah, yes, please, sir. We want, we want you to give that. See, basically, I think in a country like ours, people are so sensitive to the side effect profile. I think they first want to know about the side effects even before they want to know about the effects. So I think any medication that uh, has lesser side effects is likely to do well, well in our countries. Efficacy may, may be similar or even a little lesser. Yeah. May I make a comment, sir? Yes, sure. Please. The same thing of compar comparison of lacosamide with brevastam. 
there has been some meta analysis which are not direct uh, directly through any trial such as sana trials but on different trials so you are just bringing them together and doing a meta analysis and they look at tolerability of uh, brevastam versus lacosamide and they found no difference in the tolerability or even the efficacy that's what they say we am i'm not very really certain about how they compared the efficacy part but definitely tolerability we can understand that if they are equi- equivalently uh, to- tolerable i think uh, it, it could be you know useful to use any of the two drugs professor nandan yadya i'm just always very much reminded of professor love statement who is to say that too much of statistics will cause paralysis of your analysis i think you have to be very very careful when you compare it experience and expert play a crucial role in dividing the evidence base to it and um, i think uh, professor satish has to please come in i just need to be a bit no 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 i'm done i'm done so uh, uh, professor uh, uh, yeah professor to to please yes there is one more question last year by uh, dr mohammad nias that what is the protocol you can follow if you combine carbamazepine with brevastatin if you add brevastatin I thought there is some increase in epoxide side of carbamazepine when this, but I mean, in reality, probably there is no increase in side effects. I mean, Dr. Golda, your thoughts on it? I think this was. I think there was a um, um, a postdoc analysis um, that that showed this. I'm not entirely sure, but I, but I, but I remember that this problem was not clinically relevant. Yeah. So, but, but uh, of course, you should keep it in mind that this is a little bit uh, enzyme-inducing, and um, that this little problem of approximate. Uh, at least, if somebody gets tired after combining, then you should have it in mind. Yeah. Arshina, what may I just ask one last question? If, yeah, if, please. Uh, just one question, Doctor. Uh, Doctor, we are holding you back a lot, but just no, no. Uh, one question here. Now, as you. you know we do you think that in the next few years let's say 5 years from today uh, because it's more efficacious it has less side effects um, and i know that it's actually two different drugs but do you think brevastatin will completely eliminate or replace levetiracetam are we going to have a future 5 years from now where there's only going to be brevastatin this is a question i i, 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 I don't think, think i don't think it will erase it completely but i could imagine that it replaces it from from the first line drug Okay. Yeah, but I would like to correct you. It's not shown to be more efficacious. Oh, it's right. neither shown that it is better tolerated. It's just that when you switch from levetiracetam to brevastatin, many people have less side effects, which is a kind of a maybe semantic but 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 important difference. Um, the head to head study has not been done. Yeah, so. Yeah, sure. Yeah. For Professor Kolder, I just want to bring you the last point, which you touched on that and left it in your discussion. See this FDA for the first time of all the anti-epileptic drugs within the nine months of the approval has placed it under Schedule Five. The Australians have placed it under Schedule Four. This is much against almost all the anti-epileptic drugs that we have tried. Is there a reason, or because they have combined, especially checked it with Atrazolam one point five to three milligram for addictive properties? This is another question. I would like to have you. Answer for this because this yeah. is going to touch the heart of the practice in our uh, Indian sector because where the addictive substances once you say the CSA is going to have a real bearing on the future use because I would like to have your bench to bench side approach on this particular question. Yeah, as I said, I mean, I I have no idea why why this was placed in in this schedule four, five, like lacosamide. I mean, lacosamide. There's also no potential for for addiction. I think um, so. So I'm not really I'm not really sure why this was done. And I heard it for the first time when I got this question before uh, Jabba sent it to me. Yeah. So so I, I really don't understand it. Sorry. Yeah. No. Uh, thank you very much. No, I think. There was brevity in expression in each of us. There was brilliance shown by your excellent lecture, and you could see the bed bed set also appreciated beautifully. And you ended up with a progressive term and the clinical use. Now I open to uh, Rajeshri to just say a few words and then take it up. Rajeshri, please. Definitely. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Srinivasan, for handing over the session. Uh, I think it has been an absolutely brilliant experience, and uh, 
most of the questions this program has been uh, uh, you know has been designed in such a way that all the questions have been routed to the uh, registered participants today we had thousands of uh, neurologists joining in on this forum and uh, they have shared their questions to all the panelists and you have very uh, you know diligently and with a lot of research in your background have answered them so uh, i think linux laboratories on behalf of linux laboratories we are absolutely thankful for your time and we are grateful for your presence uh, and bringing uh, your knowledge to this forum before i uh, you know i'd like to give my a, a small screen sharing so like i said uh, there were plethora of questions that were received at the end of uh, at our end and with that uh, many of these questions have already been covered uh i will not take you through these questions again because uh diligently they were being asked by the panelists uh at this point in the show uh, once again linux laboratories as very privileged and very proud that we we could bring in best of both the worlds together in on this forum and have all the answers related to the role and place of rivaricitam be answered from your research and from the indian panel of experts i'm extremely thankful to dr holger dr avi srinivasan dr satish khadilkar dr tk banerji dr raj shikhar reddy and dr nandan yardi for bringing in your time and bringing in your experiences to this forum we'd like you to share that uh, rivaricitam is the brand from linux laboratories is bitam and we are uh, we are bring we are bringing the entire dosage form to benefit the patients for its special role in the use in therapy of partial onset epilepsy as an adjuvant therapy and drug resistant focal and generalized seizures we are very proud to share with you today is the moment where linux laboratories is one of the first companies is the first company in india to launch the britain oral solutions for pediatric use we are soon to launch the dosage form of britain injections and very shortly introducing the low dose britain 10 mg so with this the entire dosing form is going to be available for your patients use to be uh, to be benefited as a specific special role in the use in epilepsy we assure each one of the uh, the participants the delegates uh, that britain is available for your patients in